a hot ITL on clearing out the middle. We've got some great expertise coming out of Nashville. You're going to meet two brothers who absolutely rock it. And uh, Batter's Box, all coming up on this week in Pensado's Place. As promised, I've got got a really good show for you today. Oh, sure. I think I think Drew might even learn something today. Absolutely. Hope so. Man. Yeah. Drew's a man. Well, you know, he is a product of the public school system in LA. Yeah. So. And, and so, you know, that's the best in the world. Well, yeah. So so we run the show half speed when when Drew watches it. I appreciate it too. Yeah. I love Drew. But anyway, glad to have you with us. We're gonna we're gonna be talking with. Uh, Several people later on in the show, her by I can't wait. You know, I've been talking all week about this to yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. She's but everybody, meet meet my uh, partner, cohort. Hey, hey, hey. Herb Trowick. How are you, man? Man, I'm great. Yeah. I'm really excited. You know, to have Dave and uh, Dan and Ed on the show today. Absolutely. Good week, right? I, it's, it's it's been a fun week because uh, sometimes in our profession you need an excuse to talk to people. So I've talked to. And this show certainly serves as a good excuse for us to talk to people, which is a good thing. Which, yeah. by the way, in talking to people, uh, one of the people that we want to talk to the most is you. Um, we want to thank you for your comments and questions. It helps us shape the show. Uh, our intent is really to have the show be useful for you as much as can be. So please keep it coming. Um, you know the drill. It's all the various addresses. So our Twitter handle is at Pensado Place. Uh, Email Pensado Place at thisweekend.com, our Facebook page, YouTube channel, and then also the live chat room that we call the Corner Office, which uh, is powered by Ustream and manned by our man, Drew Adams. What's up, sir? Boo! <laughs> Bring back Zan. Bring hey, back Zan. Hey, Dave's a big hater. That's all. How, how, <laughs> how are you, man? Doing well. How you are good? you, doing? We got folks in the chat room? We got a lot of things going on. We got probably a record amount of people in the chat room today. Oh, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Over 100 plus. So. Wow, that's great. Yeah. That's the kind of involvement we want, engagement we want. So, uh, no, Herb, I got to stop you. He, he wants to take credit for that. Well, we, we give him credit because remember last time <laughs> we, were, we were giving him commission in a very special way. Uh, anyway, so enough of that. Let's get on with the show, Dave. Okay. What we got going, man? Uh, this week's uh, batter's box, a new segment that we do. Uh, we've got Ed C. Ed, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about Ed later. But when I was learning to engineer, and I use the term verb learning loosely. Mm -hmm. Back when I started out realizing that I, I wanted to do this, Ed got me through a lot of dark times. He taught me a l was lot that, about engineering. Was that racial? Dark times? Yeah. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> Just keep going. <laughs> but, uh, 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 <laughs> keep going. That's all right. That's all right. I just had an Al Sharpton moment. That's all right. That's good. Um, <laughs> man, I lost my whole train of thought. Uh, anyway, uh, Ed's on the show. We're going to have a lot of fun talking with Ed, by the way. Uh, just a little teaser. At one time, Ed had the Guinness World Book of World Records uh, record for the most consecutive weeks on the chart for, for a song, which was I Go Crazy by Paul Davis. Wow. As we speak, he has the same record for the country charts. Oh, that's uh, yeah, we'll talk to him about that. It's, uh, uh, an artist named Lee Bryce. He's he, he shattered the old record. He's, I think he's probably a, over a year now. That's fantastic. And then many, many, many more accomplishments. He's, I credit him, and rightly so, teaching me how to engineer him. And another guy in Atlanta, Phil Benton, taught me a lot. And then a, a mutual friend of ours, Paul Davis, who we'll, we'll actually talk about. And then Dave Huff, my buddy. Sure. Uh, I got to see pictures of Dave with long hair this week. It was. It's traumatic. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. Now I know why he always wears a backwards baseball hat. In the ITL about Dave's hair? <laughs> no, that was about my dye job. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Got and then, uh, and then uh, not to slight him, his brother, uh, Dan. Um, as some of you know, I'm a guitar player, and I, 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 I don't, I'm not sure I've ever said that another guitar player was better than me, but I think Dan Huff is better than me on guitar. Dave's certainly better than me on drums. Mm -hmm. But... I actually know how to play a little guitar, and uh, his brother is, you know, I'm going to say it, Herb. He's amazing. There you go. There you and, go. Uh, we'll go over some of their credentials. Uh, ITL I'm, I'm real proud of because uh, 
it answers a lot of questions that you guys have had. By the way, the question, the question since we started, oh, I, golly, I got I, I to gotta find this person's name. I hope I can do this quickly. Someone asked me, more than you know, asked me, how do you compress the cowbell to get more out of it? That's the best question <laughs> we have had so far. I don't have a clue. I'm going to go home tonight and practice EQ and, and compressing cowbells. Dan, and I'll get back to you on that one. Great question. I'm not making fun of you. I, 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 uh, I just have all sorts of SNL flashbacks with uh, Will Ferrell. Blue yeah. Oyster Cult, yeah. So Let's go to ITL. ITL, here it comes. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's Into the Lair. Uh, a little shout out to Zan, my man, over in D.C. Will's helping us out today. Um, I'm going to try the impossible, and I'm going to tell you right now it can't be done. I can't do what I want to do in one, two, three, four shows. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and explain to you how to get width and depth, and we're going to start a foundation. We're not going to finish it. We're going to start the foundation for that. What we're going to start with is clearing out the middle. So today and next week, we're going to go into a little bit of how to clear out the middle. This isn't the only ways to do it. I'm just, I want you to not so much use my examples literally, but use literally, but use, um, use them as a way to think about your own techniques about um, moving things out the middle. We're going to start first off. <clears throat> okay, we're going to start with uh, a synth part, and I'm going to show you uh, a pretty basic way. This is a plugin called Isotope, and uh, the reason I chose this is because it's fairly representative of um, of a technique where you would go to, like, say, outboard wise, you would go to like a BASE unit, a spatializer unit, uh, the Behringer, um, what's that thing called? Edison. All those do what I'm going to do in the box. Okay, let me let me give you a before. I'm bypassed. Okay, uh, this is a preset I made up. Basically, let me go through it for you so you can copy it. Um, on the loudness side, I'm using that. Uh, on the exciter, I'm, I'm raising a little high end. Right here, you can tell I'm raising the high end from about 5k up. Uh, and then just a just a generic compressor. But here's the guy. This is the uh, multiband stereo imaging. So I'm going to show you with it. Okay. You got me? Pretty cool. So now that what we're doing, you can see, I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit. See that the center kind of clears out a little bit. Okay, that's one technique, and that's representative of a whole group of things. I'm moving fast. Now, stay with me. Now, I'm going to show you a, a, a newer one. This is, um, we went into this the other day. Um, this is uh, Dr. MS. I love this plug-in. Uh, this is from an actual song. Study that one for a minute. That's uh, um, I would say this is more similar to uh, it's, it's part of the MS technique. Now your homework for next week is to do a little research and a little study on MS techniques. You can find some of that on uh, Pro Sound Web. Brad Blackwood's uh, moderated forum on there. Brad was our guest a couple of weeks ago. A lot of good information, and you will be quizzed on that soon. 
Now this technique, um, I love this, I love this. This is a good one. This one, what we're going to do is, we're, we don't need anything on this one. Um, I, this track right here, this string track, I, um, I made a, I made a, I, I made two mono tracks out of it. Um, okay, so now um, so now this this track is is just separated into mono and and what I've done is I've taken I've taken this track the purple one, uh, the top one, and I've shifted it seven milliseconds earlier. I've shifted this one seven milliseconds later. And, of course, panned them hard left and right. And now, remember, this came from this track, but instead of, I can't, I can't easily do that here. You, you can shift the whole track early and then, and then put a delay on one side. Now watch, watch what this does. I'm going to try and A-B this for you. And don't be afraid to do this either. Watch this, guys. That's another way of getting it out the middle. But Dave, what about mono? What about mono? Okay, and if you've done your homework for this week, you've looked up the Haas effect, H-A-A-S. And what the Haas effect says, um, watch this. Okay, here's Wikipedia. I typed in Haas, H-A-A-S, effect. And read this. This will explain to you why we're not necessarily uh, getting phase problems. Um, I could read it to you, but I'm not, because I want you to check this out. This is a very, very, very important concept, and, and, and we're going to use it again in, in a couple of minutes. This one's kind of silly, but I thought I'd show you just as a way to, um, just to get you thinking a little bit. Now we're going to go back to our uh, string part. I'm going to loop this. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two plugins. Okay, I'm going to put one side of the strings out of phase, in phase, out of phase. And now, to kind of mess with my air a little bit, I'm going to pan that. Okay, now we can pan it faster and, and, it, and it messes with, the, now let's take them both off so you can kind of hear what's going on. You can even hear that over there, can't you, Will? That's pretty cool. Back on. And then you can experiment with a faster rate. The faster the rate, the, the less time your ear has to focus on the out of phase part because it's moving it away. Now if we increase the depth, that gets a little crazy. But there again, experiment. Combine some of these things. Let me know. Um, send me like three or four bars of an example soloed. I, I'd love to hear what you guys come up with. Okay, guys, so your homework assignment for next week, you're going to go to Wikipedia and other sources and read about the Haas effect, H-A-A-S. And then I want you to read about the fletcher munson curves. Dylan mentioned that on a show earlier. And those are some really important concepts. We're going to get into some of these things because in order for me to discuss how to make a, a mix wide and how to give it depth, we have to have certain basic tools under our grasp and under our belt before we can use those building blocks to, to do it. This is not a function of one thing, width and depth. It's a function of a lot of little smaller components. All right, back to you, Dave. 
Man, that was a good end to the lair. I, 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 I hope you guys like that one. I really like it. I'm sitting here looking at my new Boney James CD, um, Contact. Drew and I worked on this for Boney, and uh, along with my buddy Dave Rideau. It's good stuff, good stuff. One of my favorite, he is my favorite sa uh, sax player. <laughs> it's jazz. Wow. I've never heard of wow. sax. I know. How does the sash sound? Well, you know, I do have medical excuses oh, for this. That's right. I, That's I right. can bring a doctor's note saying that I'm <laughs> qualified to say anything bad. I got Dave Huff, man, my buddy. I've been dying to meet his brother Dan. Hey, Dave. Dave, you there? Dan, hey. you might just have to turn around and look at the screen, okay? Here we go. D Dan, pleasure to meet you, my friend. <laughs> pleasure to meet you, too. Was, was that you, David, calling me on my That was me. Yeah, I just called. Just make sure you're looking. Uh, <laughs> Man. Was, sorry, I was trying to use a little extra time there. You, uh, you two guys, uh, I, I got to tell you, um, I, I, I've, I've known about you guys for a long time because whenever a guitar player hears another guitar player, Herb, that's better than them, it pisses you off. Absolutely. It just pisses you off. Absolutely. And Dan Huff is... He's got to be one of the best guitar players I've I've heard in a long time, if not ever. Yeah. And uh, uh, I was watching your video, Dan. I think it was called Instruction. Uh, I wrote it down. Uh, uh, the DVD instructions on how to play studio guitar. And Dan, this this is twenty year, twenty years ago. Remember? I know Dan had hair back then. He had a lot. Well, we all had hair back then. <laughs> we all did. Even Herb. <laughs> and. Um, uh, man, you guys are, you guys, I, I actually went through my old, uh, some of my old CDs, I actually found my Giant CD. They, they, they were in a band called Giant, which was uh, just an incredible band, incredible material, White Heat. Um, and then your dad is also a, a very accomplished, Ron, very accomplished string arranger, right guys? Absolutely. Yes. And, and Dan, your daughter is... Just kind of making some waves, isn't she? She sure seems to be. I mean, it's it's all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, growing up in the music business, what's the, the logical thing a father's going to tell a daughter, especially his first kid? You're going to say, do not go into the music business. Oh, absolutely. I did that, too. And of all things, you know, I mean, and the worst thing would be what? Being a... Chick singer, <laughs> yeah. and I, I, I don't really mean that, but I, some of that I did mean, and, and yeah. I, and I, of course, I told her that, educate her with that, and uh, what does she do? Looks at me square in the eye and said, "Dad, I'm going to be a singer." So that was the end of that. She's doing very good. Wow. Well, tell her, uh, you congratulations. know, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Congratulations. Tell her that we send our blessings, and then, uh, of course, Dave's got a, got a kid in the movie industry too. Mm. He's an editor, film editor, studying. But um, so, guys. Tell me what you're working on these days. What are you working on, uh, Dan? Right now, I'm I'm working with uh, a band, Rascal Flats, who I've been working with for <laughs> a about a band, a band called Rascal Flats. <laughs> you, you never you, you never know who, who listens to what, yeah. but uh, no, they're really good. They're yeah. they're dear friends, and um, uh, right now we're starting their new record, and also. They just did a collab. They did two collaborations, which have been really interesting. Actually, three. Um, they did a collaboration with Justin Bieber. Then, on the other side of the coin, they did one with Lionel Richie. Wow. And then they also wrote a song for this uh, for with Michael Bolton, who's who's a close personal friend. I, that's actually what I'm working on today. Oh man, I, I, I wish I knew those guys. I, I mixed a song or worked on a song that they did with Brian McKnight, and uh, oh, yeah. pretty impressive. Dave, they're, they're, you and I just finished a, a project. How's that going? Is that out yet? That's not out yet. That, it turned out really good. It was Australian Idol winner pop record. Um, and thanks for mixing it. Your, your mixes sounded amazing, as usual. I'll pay um, you later. And uh, I'm working on a new country hey, artist. Hey, Herb, did we get paid for that? Uh, <laughs> that, that hey. See, Dave, Dave, so Dave Huff, we've been running this joke. <laughs> about whether to bring this up on the show or not. I was like, no, 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 we, we'll call him later, stay cool. And he stepped completely outside the boundaries. So, Dave, I'll call you later. He got me earlier in the show, Dave. I had to get him back. I, I've been hey, waiting you know all day to get him. I, oh, if you can make Herb Trowick speechless, you've accomplished something. Oh, my God. Hey, hey Herb, idea for another show. Honestly, 
let's do a show where, where there's where we get the record label and AR people on the phone and say, hey, now we did the record, we just turned it in a month ago. Where where is the back end money? Where's the money? I like How about this segment? I Listen, like that segment. There's a, there, <laughs> and we could do about ten shows on that process. Oh, why, it, why it's so screwed Start up. Start calling some names. Okay. Yeah. Hey Dan, if I embarrass you, stop me, okay, my friend? Dan Herb, <laughs> I, I don't know if you knew this, but Dan played guitar on Man in the Mirror. Mm -hmm. My Heart Will Go On, Celine Dion. He played guitar on Here We Go Again, White Snake. Mm -hmm. and, right, and, and there's a rumor of something about Tony Katane and Dan, but I, we won't go into that. Because uh, <laughs> didn't Dan have a Jaguar? And some <laughs> trying to build the Jaguars. Anyway, something like I that. Pro I promised the Huff Brothers there would be no, no surprises. Yeah. And, and, and Dan, you played on Rhythm of the Night. You played on um, Mariah Carey, One Sweet Day. But I got, a, I got a surprise for you. The person that found straight up for Paul Abdul is Herb Trowick. He's the one that found that song. And, that song and you played guitar on that song. Did you work with Elliot Wolf? Yes, I did. That, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a there's a funny story which I won't bore our audience with. I actually found the song for somebody else whose husband talked that particular artist out of it. Then Jim oh. Corfield and I started talking about it. And I said, you should think about this for Paula, which had a singles deal, and then obviously it turned into something else. So we share a little bit of that history, man. It's fantastic. Dan, when you um, when you select a studio to do your productions and your recording in, do you put more emphasis on the sound of the room or the, or, the, or the gear? In other words, which side of the glass do you put the most emphasis on when you decide uh, on, on a particular studio for a particular artist? You know, probably more, I would say I'd put the emphasis on just the, more or less the vibe, you know, where the artist feels comfortable. And where he, where he wants to spend a, you know, a good chunk of time trying to track and figure out. In other out words, the, the whole studio, you don't separate it. It's, it's the whole studio, the vibe of the whole studio. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I can't answer that yes or no. I mean, you know, we have Blackbird Studios here in Nashville now. Oh, incredible. And, yeah, and, and you know, John McBride has, has provided probably one of the, the best studios in North America. I mean, and we, could, we could even extend the boundaries. But, you know, so, and, and it's absolute quality mass of of, of uh, gear i mean it's it, he yeah, has i've a, heard that that place is is like for it, us it's like dying and going to heaven it must be what heaven's yeah. like well and 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 on top of the, the the audio gear then it's it's instruments it's you know instruments you know what 16 drum vintage drum kits vintage guitars amps you know it goes on he's he's just he's absolutely immersed in it it, the vibe is great. Everything's great about it. But but ironically enough, you know, some artists, you know, don't want to don't want to always be in a compound like that. They, they not necessarily want to be with that much great gear. Some artists prefer more of a commando kind of element of a studio. And so as a producer, I, I have to um, acquiesce to, to to those demands and to those desires. I mean, if I had my way, I I think I'd just live at Blackbird. So wow. so that's that's kind of the way. But but I'm but I'm not afraid. I mean, we just we just recorded a. Uh, the the latest Keith Urban record. Oh, uh, say hello to Keith. I, I did a remix for him. Oh, okay. I, well, I, well, I, 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 I was actually, stunned. He was he was that guy's talented, isn't he? He's wonderful, and, and he Keith is is the kind of guy that that um, he he goes left when you say right, and right when you say left. Yeah. But he we we recorded that record primarily at a friend of ours, uh, uh, you know, project studio in their backyard. So anyway, wow. that's uh, sorry about the long answer, but that's kind of the, the long or short. Of no, answer. that's all right. You know, I, I just promised Dave I'd give him more time than you, but that's all right. <laughs> so, but so Dave, you, speaking you of Martina my McBride, you worked on uh, you you played drums on one of her records, didn't you? I did early, early, early on. Oh, that's oh. cool. Hey, tell me about Dave. You also played drums on a Joe Perry record, the guitar player from Aerosmith. How was that? I did. I I played drums on. Um, on a lot of different parts. It, it, it was cool. It was cool. It, him, he and um, and then another artist in the era, same kind of guy as um, Mark Farner. I oh. think you probably heard of that yeah, one too. Yeah, Grand Funk Railroad. Yeah, it, 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 they were both very cool. You know, cool, very cool people, very down to earth artists, and loved music. You know, wow. that, that was back in my other life when I actually played drums on records. Yeah, yeah, but you, you you're doing pretty good now. 
Now, you know, Dave, while I got you on the phone here, uh, that's an expression we use in the South, man. Uh, how the hell did you sneak an 808 kick drum onto a country record? That, a good question. Good question. Uh, you know, I guess back when I first started programming on country records, I remember there was an article on me on, on one record in particular I, I worked on, a girl named Cindy Thompson. In USA Today, somebody somebody blasted whoever is doing these loops and sneaking them in. <laughs> I got blasted in USA Today. But, you know, I mean, you know, uh, there's a few producers, obviously Dan being one of them, Paul Worley, that, that in, you know, allow the feel of certain things and, and aren't afraid of, of, you know, those kind of so sonic, you know, realms to be allowed into country music and country music has evolved a lot as well too so but you know i mean oh, yeah. that's probably probably a lot of my background being being very much an r&b you know I, I worked on a lot of r&b records when i first moved to la a lot of dance records and so that's kind of like a part of of, of a feel you know of a feel thing and that's that's kind of what i used to, i kind of snuck it in you know oh cool i, 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 I want to come back and talk to you about that okay uh dan um when i was watching some of your videos I, I I learned a lot about about the way you layer guitars. Like you you would do like a like a distorted guitar through a Marshall, like like you'd use like a a, a Strat through a Marshall, and you'd get like the basic basic sound. Then you'd come and layer cleaner. Like like in one example you gave, you used a Les Paul, and you you overlaid some like cleaner guitars on top of that. Is that a technique you're still using uh, in, in some of the current records you're making? And if it is, can you describe a little bit of how you layer guitars to get a clean, dirty sound? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a horrible interview. I mean, in some sense, because I don't, I don't really have, I, I don't have a methodology that I, that I kind of adhere to. No, I like that. I think that's great. Yeah, I mean. It, it's it's kind of like doing crossword puzzles or, or puzzles. You know, I mean, you 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 start with a, an idea, and then you kind of putter and, and, and move stuff around a little bit. I mean, it. it well, I, I can tell you what I start with. I mean, it, you know, basic tone on the guitar. I prefer two mics up close, a uh, 57 and a, and a and a Royer 121, and and I, I can find pretty much the basis of, of any sound with those two mics. I mean, just putting those two mics in a perspective with one another. They they each give what the other mic doesn't. And, um, you know, sometimes we add some rooms and stuff like that. But um, I prefer not to layer guitars if I can help it. But, mm -hmm. but, but you know, if, if a song in, a, in the type of music, you know, especially if it's a little bit more pop in nature, um, I'll do, uh, I will do that kind of layering. I mean, which I just copied from Mutt Lang. That's, you know, there's yeah. no secret there. And, and I, I was lucky to, to work with Mutt a lot as a guitar player. Wow. So. You know, I got, uh, yeah, talk about, like, uh, being able to, to uh, you know, it's like I didn't have to go to school. I mean, I actually got paid to, to learn, in essence, what, what happened. But, but it, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's, he, he, he really showed me that, that sometimes some of the geekiest, small, tiny little sounds become really relevant in, in, the, in the, the soundscape of guitars. And so to address your question, like, for instance, if you're doing a, a, a power type guitar, you know, you're say you're running through a Marshall or, or you know a, a, a Bogner or something like that, a, a fair amount of hair on it. Okay, that's going to create a saturation and a depth. But but sometimes as a record gets built up, the middle of the sound goes away, the mid range. So then you then I'll go back in maybe and and take the same guitar and double that part with with a, a smaller mid range amp, maybe a Fender. Um, with very little distortion, and just kind of again, just kind of you you know, take it and put put the put it inside the glove, so to speak. Either that, or I mean, you know, you're talking about all the plugs we have nowadays. Eleven is is stunning amp farm. Every one of those things has a has a has a uh, a rightful purpose in, yeah. in kind of doing guitar records. You know. Yeah, I agree. Hey, Dave, um, yeah. you've got a obviously you have a love of percussion and all things noisy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hey, hey, Dan, it could have been worse. Your daughter could have been a drummer, but that's another well, story. His, his son is. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Explain to me your interest in, you, you know, give me like a little, a little overview of, you've, you've made records, uh, world music records. Uh, define, like, like when I think of world music, um, it, 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 it's such a broad category and it's such a, I don't know, it's just, you know, growing up in South Florida, you hear a lot of Cuban music. 
give me a little overview of what you're doing in world music and your opinion about where it's at, uh, you know, for our audience that might not be too familiar with world music. Yeah, well, you know, my definition of world music when I first got into it was kind of like the group Enigma. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, it was kind of pop, but it, it was real moody and, you know, and, um, and I was fortunate enough to be around some companies that, that, um, that were getting into that, that realm. And, and I was, you know, I, I got to be creative. And it's one of those things where, you know, when somebody, when you work on other records and they say, put it on your solo record, well, that's what I did. You know, you put stuff that you want to create moods and, you know, just kind of, to me, that, the world music is kind of like cruising music. You know, you put it on and it's basically background. It's kind of just mood music. And is it fair to say that it's very percussive, very, very rhythmic, very... Uh... Yeah, you know, some of, it, some of it is. I mean, obviously the stuff that, that I, I gravitate towards is very much that way. I mean, Enigma was for sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, it's based on loops. You know, my influences on that kind of music are all the way from London, you know, soul to soul and all that kind of stuff in Enigma. And then yeah. I kind of combine that with... With you know, I mean, I do, you know, I do theme presented music. Some of it's you know Asia, some of it's Brazil, some of it's you know, it's just it's just theme based. Wow! Give me a name of one of your records that that, that our audience can go check out some of what you're doing. Well, the, I have a group that's just that's me, myself, and I. It's my schizophrenic group. It's, it's called World Beat, and and I have uh, four or five records out on that. So you can you can find that it's on Amazon. Oh wow! Hey Dan. Um, Two-time CMA Musician of the Year, two-time Producer of the Year. My goodness, my friend, that's that's some pretty impressive credentials. You mentioned Paul Worley, by the way, um, the cat that kind of helped me get going. One of several, but the one I credit the most because I learned the most from him. Uh, Ed C used to work with Paul a lot. They made a lot of great records. Ed's coming on right after you guys. It's an all Nashville day here at Pensado's place. Dan, when you're, when, like, 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 I made the statement last week that I think probably the best records, the best engineers, the best players, the best writers are all in Nashville. Uh, and I, I, I invited people to flame me on the internet. So far, I, they've been very kind because my audience is a kind audience, and I appreciate that. But uh, I might have been exaggerating a little bit, a little bit for effect. But I tell you what, some of the best musicianship and and let's, let's, like just, just at Blackbird, some of the best gear, just so many of the things that we enjoy, the three of us, it seems like are epitomized by Nashville. Like Ed C was one of the first people I ever knew to, uh, to, to use digital in, in, in the world, and much less in country music. What's your take in terms of, of you mentioned some plugins like Eleven and, and Ant Farm and that. Uh, are, are you, are you, in your production style, are you using all the cards in the deck, or do you try and lead a little more towards the analog side, or is just whatever fits the whatever fits the, the process? What you, the last thing you said, def, definitely. You you want to, you know, technology. You got to watch out that you become a slave to the updates. You know, mm -hmm. I and mean, that's the that's the toughest thing because you spend your time chasing uh, mm -hmm. the newest and latest and greatest, but you certainly have to keep up to date. Um, I prefer, I mean, as a player, I always felt like you wanted to learn to play as much as, as, as wide of a, uh, you know, a swath that you could cut to, so, that, so that whenever you get in a situation, you can draw from different experiences. Mm -hmm. Same thing technologically. I think, I think having access to it, but always putting in perspective of, of, of that which you're trying to serve, which is the music. So, mm -hmm. so whatever serves the music the best at that moment, that's what you're going to gravitate towards. Because in the, at the end of the day, you know, when, when we, we're trying to make stuff that people really feel the need to uh, to have, you know, and hopefully hopefully to purchase. Wow, what's yeah. your what's your go-to vocal compressor? Uh, you know what? It's 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 funny. I, um, Tube Tech always is it is it CLB? I, I never CL1B. know. CL1B. Yeah, the blue thing. Yeah, That's, I love that too. I like that, and you know what's funny? I mean, I I like I like the uh, this box box. I've been using this a lot lately. I don't know why I got it, but but uh, it's yeah, such easy. You know, whatever it's sitting in the back of the, the manly box box. Yeah. It's kind of mimics a, a, a tube check, right? Yeah. If you couldn't use either one of those, uh, and, and you were forced to to use a plug-in, what would that plug-in be? Well, before the plug-in, it would be a distressor, no doubt. And then the plug-in. You know what? On on all the vocals that I'm that I'm doing, I still 
tend to go with the Vox. I mean, I'm sorry, the the R Vox. Yeah. 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 And 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 don't ask me why. It probably is the first one that I learned how to use, and and so probably just re react. I got a bunch on that on the two, but that's the one I put on the vocals. Wow. And Dan, I mean, I mean, Dave, like as a drummer, I I, I I've mixed some of your tracks and. Uh, your programming is immaculate. I mean, do you when you when you when you go to program drums on a on a record that that might traditionally have a live feel? Do you feel a responsibility to keep your program drums sounding live, or you just do whatever the heck you want? Yeah, well, you know, it just depends on 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 the music. Once again, you know, I mean, I, I, certain songs need the feel of, of a mechanical thing, and, and then when the things need to be live. You know, then you, you you program accordingly. You know, you program mm -hmm. more a little looser than just you know. I don't, I don't ever grid everything to the grid unless, unless it just has to you know has to be like that. But that's pretty rare for me. Oh really? So so let me let me follow up a question on that. When you're programming drums, you you, you just you, you don't quantize them. You just leave it the way you feel and tighten up a a a, a, a drum here or there. Yeah. Well, well, the what I used to do is I I usually put. The, the kicks are always pretty on. It, it depends if it's if it's a live thing or not. But uh -huh. yeah, I'll keep the kicks on and I'll move the snares around a little bit. I, I've always, you know, I grew up in the South and and my tendency is is to usually have, Dan's probably the same. I mean, I know it's the same. To always put the snare a little bit on the South side, a little back, a little on the yeah, back. Yeah, I do so that too. Yeah, so it just feels, you know, that's just yeah. kind of how p players in the South and R&B. Well, we call it we call it in the pocket, landing in your back pocket, laying yep. it back, and then then it just got shortened to pocket. But yeah. but with pop music, you know, it's kind of weird to kick. We're so our ears are so accustomed to drum machines, so kicks kind of always to me has got to be spot on, you know. Wow. Can I add something to, to what David does? Um, Dave is, is is a lot of times, uh, you know, depending on 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 the type of record, David's great with massaging tracks too. Yeah. And 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 what it really shows, I mean, the answer to all these questions seem to kind of have the same theme. You know, it, it's there. There is no set way of doing anything. It has to. It has to serve what you're doing. But, like, uh, you know, anybody can can cut and paste or, or you know dissect and and, and grid drums. Mm -hmm. But but the key is that's that's not music. That's a math. That's a you know a, a basically a, a theorem. You know, mm -hmm. David's really good about that because a lot of times, like, I'll need I'll need tracks. Uh, massaged would be the word I use. I don't need them gritted because I don't like gritted music. I think I think that whole era is just it's it's becoming passe anyway. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you need the clarity, and um, he's really good about that because he he hears it as a drummer and he doesn't he doesn't over quantize anything. And it's and again it's it's not something that you can sit down. You can't teach somebody to do this because you have to be able to hear it. It's like being a musician. Yeah. With a, you know. So. Yeah. My mom. My mom. Uh always told me that you, 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 you practice with a metronome and you learn perfect timing. Once you get that, you move on to feel. Yeah. Uh, perfect is not the end of the road. Feel is the end of the road. Yeah, so you, could give, about you. you could give somebody your template for mixes and, and it's, you know, it's like a piano. No, no two people are going to do it the same way. You know? yeah. yeah. Hey, guys, I, 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 please, please, please come back. I, I've got a million, uh, a million more questions for you. Well, aren't we gonna? Why don't we ask them to stay with us through the corner office? Okay, <clears throat> guys, do you mind staying with us um, and asking some, answering some questions from our corner office? It's we've got a ton of people in there because you're guests, and um, we'll fire some questions around. Can you stick with us for a little bit? Sure, I came for free for a few. Yeah, cool. Okay, thanks, cool. guys. So hey, Drew, tell Ed, we said hey too. Yeah. So Drew, tee us up. What, what do right. we have? Well, uh, we'll start off with a true false. Um, the That's Yamaha good. HS series, this is kind of all around for everybody. The Yamaha HS series uh, speakers is as good as the NS10s. True or false? Well, I'm going to follow up on the Huff Brothers theme of uh, the, the, the question that has a flaw in it, and that's the word better. Uh, I know some people that are using those and just love them. And then it's just monitors are such a personal thing. Uh, I, I know Dan and Dave have their favorites. Uh, that's a whole three-month series on monitors. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. What, we'll get to that question. Whatever uses yeah. kind of deal. Give, give me something for Dan and Dave. <clears throat> True or false? Musicians make better mixers. Dan and Dave. Uh, I, I would say true. Not to offend any mixers who aren't musicians. I, you know, I think, I think it's true. I, 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 true. I, I, I work a lot with Justin Niebank, and Justin's a bass player. 
And I've always maintained that, that yes, his instincts are more about the song than it is about the technology. Uh, can I, can I yeah, toss please, my please, two please. cents in? I, I would say true with a footnote, and that's that there's so many different types of mixing, so many different types of music. The, types, the type of music that Dan and, and Dave and I like, I'd say it gives you a, a definite head start. But if, if you're a mixer and you don't know music, teach yourself music. You know, like the Huff Brothers had a, a very gifted, talented father, but basically Dan's a self-taught guitar player. Dave taught himself how to play drums. You can do that. You can teach yourself and mix too. So it's not an either or. If, you, if you're a mixer and you're not a musician, it's because you're lazy. Gotcha. Uh, we got a question here from Funk Mono Two. It says, "How do you make guitars wider on a track without playing multiple passes?" Is that for you? You know what? I, I did an end to the layer next week about that, and and Will just told me that the audio on it wasn't that good. But uh, Dan touched on it briefly. Uh, study some Mutt Lang records, right, Dan? Absolutely. Yeah. Good answer. Cool deal. And uh, this one's for you, Dave. Uh, the if what effects did you use on Boney James' sax, uh, also compressors on the sax, from Simon Tompkins? Oh, man, thank you, thank you. Um, I used uh, a ton of Bricasti reverb. I used uh, Tanglewood, and I used a uh, Hall. I used um, uh, a lot of the Waves, the waves bundle, um, a lot of the SSL stuff. Compressor I used was the uh, was Chris's 1176. I love 1176s, and the uh, the waves one is really good on that. Uh, and then and then some just generic echoes, just the the digi echoes on it. Nice. And uh, we got a question for you, Dan. Um, somebody's raving about Keith Urban's Defying Gravity and wants to know how do you treat the uh, acoustic guitars. Good question. Give, give him a pen, Herb. I'm writing this down. <laughs> Dan, you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Sorry. I, you know what? We do it. So, we do it so many different ways. I mean, sometimes Keith will be in in the house. This is no joke. We'll be doing a vocal, and and we we, we do a lot of vocals up here in my my little room that I like to edit in at my house, and and he'll be sing. We sing usually into a two six nine, and um, and whatever preamp compressor that we have sitting around. And uh, a lot, sometimes Keith just turns the mic over and puts it down, and that, that'll be the guitar chain, the same as the vocal chain. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that, that my, my engineer, I can get you the answer. If somebody wants to send it to me, I can hook him up with, with the engineer who does all the overdubs, a guy named Mark Hagen in Nashville. He's great with guitar sounds. And I don't know if it's just that I'm lazy, but I never have taken the time to learn the mic setup that he uses. It's usually three mics, um, two on the... Uh, neck where the neck meets the body and one's a Sony that's all I know and then he puts one on the the, the far end on the body and and getting the phase correct is, is really important yeah. run through a lot of distressors and uh, other than that I'm sorry I can I can find out yeah. but I, I can toss something man I, I would I would bet a lot of money probably uses a KM84 at some point and probably an AKG 451 I got a question for you guys um, sure. by the way I wrote all that down Dan um, <laughs> and and all you guys watching at home, you will be quizzed on this. Um, the last time I was in Nashville, a lot of the acoustic guitar players would take a 12-string set, and, and instead of the, the low E string, they would use the high E string from a 12-string set, do the same thing with the A and same thing with the D, so that when they played rhythm with that setup, it, 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 you, you didn't have any low wound strings on the guitar because you, you stole the... Am I making sense, Herb? Complete. Okay. Do they? Do you guys still do that? Yeah, sometimes I, they, they usually call it a high third guitar. Yeah. What it is? Yeah. We used to call it Nashville tuning, but. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a sound. I mean, it, you know, it, it definitely. It, it's it a gives that bright, jangly acoustic without without the mud. Yeah. You know what? I prefer to that. It sounds. It's a. It's a sound. It's a little bit clean and a little bit sweet for my taste. Mm -hmm. But you know, I tell you, a great double with acoustics are, is using a bazooki. Are you serious? That's the Greek. Uh, it's yep. tuned. That's tuned in fifths, though, right? Uh, well, we cheat and we tune it to however we want to tune it. Oh, you okay. know, but, but uh, that sound gives it a little bit more of a wild sound. Uh, wow. if, if you can get a bazooki, that's a great sound. So if you go to a Greek restaurant, that's what you hear, right? <laughs> a bazooki. <laughs> 
Wow. I, I like that. I didn't know that. Is that pretty common, Dan? Um, I don't know how common it is. I mean, it's common with me. I mean, I, I like the sound, so, so it's very common. Wow. I mean, the good thing is you, you can play it on a record and serve hummus on it at night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's a good stopping spot, right, Herb? Absolutely. Perfect. Huff Brothers, hey, thank I gotta you. tell you, man, I love both you guys. <laughs> Dave, you know I love you, Dan. You're my new best friend. Absolutely. And I gotta Same. tell you, you guys listening at home, if you want to learn how to play drums, and if you're an engineer and you want to learn how to be a musician, you couldn't have two finer models to choose from in terms of uh, drumming. And, and Dave is completely well-rounded in terms of his musicianship. He plays guitar, he plays keyboards, and then Dan, you're my new hero on guitar, my friend. Uh, my mom taught guitar, so taught me guitar, so uh, it's a very special instrument to me, and I, I just love listening to you play. You've got, I, 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 one day we'll go over influences, because I know you and I have so many of the same influences, I can hear it in your playing. But guys, thank you so much. I know both of you are incredibly busy. Good luck, and, uh, and please, please come back another time for us, if, 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 if you will. And Dave, I'll call you later. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'll call you later. later. We'll talk. Sure. <laughs> thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Herb. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Drew, thanks, good to guys. see thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, thanks you. Dan. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Cool. Great guys. Man, I tell you what, I, I, I can't impress upon you guys that watch that uh, how talented the two people you just saw it's are. I mean, I, I forgot to tell you. I mean, they've they've done Bon Jovi. They've mm -hmm. done. Um, Oh my gosh! Well, you know the other the other thing I've only met Dave. The other thing is that they're just such cool people, and that doesn't always come with really talented people. No, you're, you're they're, so right. I mean, cool I didn't tell you some of the stuff that uh, that Dave did. I mean, it's like um, just just look him up. I mean, uh, he, Dan Huff produced Megadeth. <laughs> I'm telling you, he produced Megadeth. You you you, you think you listen to couple of Nashville buddies, but these guys are, they live in Nashville, but they're world class, world class. Megadeth and bon to Paul Jovi. Abdul to Bon Jovi. I'm to, telling you. That's a pretty, pretty when, wide when, range. When he says something, it's, it's, you got to listen to it. Uh, are we ready for batter's box? Yeah, let's, let's okay. roll. Uh, let's Yo, roll. let's see. There you are. Hey. Edward. How are you? Oh, man. I tell you what. Of, of all the reasons I do this show, I got impressed on everybody watching uh, that what you're seeing and what you're about to hear is the main reason I do all of this. Uh, Ed C. is the guy that taught me how to engineer, and I'm stretching, the, stretching that a little bit, Edward, as you know, but Phil Benton taught me a lot. I learned a lot from Larry Turner. I learned a lot from our friend Paul Davis, but it was Ed that, 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 that gave me the courage to do this and and and, and his opinions uh I, I i hope i've carried the tradition of some of your techniques absolutely uh, carried that flag uh man i didn't realize this until recently I, well, I knew one of the things ed c herb has the record for uh most consecutive weeks on the pop charts with I go crazy by Paul Davis, mm -hmm. and that was that. I think I think uh, now it, it's it's been supplanted by some other things. But it replaced that record with the longest consecutive country uh, yeah, single right now. Uh, impressive. That's impressive. Uh, 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 I mean, yeah, it was I, uh, the 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 Lee Bryce record, uh, uh, "Love Like Crazy," and it, uh, it 56 consecutive weeks in the chart and. Uh, Kind of wacky. It it beat Eddie Arnold's record back in 1948, and uh, wow. So <laughs> incredible. Wow. Who knew? Yeah. Let me let me tell our viewers. Ed Ed has has recorded mix. Ed's a musician. He's an ba incredible bass player. Uh, bass player also. But Ed has Ed has done uh, Willie Nelson, Hank Williams Jr., uh, Martina McBride, McBride, Paul Davis, and. Um, Somebody that you guys might not know, he worked with John Prine. John Prine, um, if you love Dylan, you'll love John Prine. They're both, uh, lyrics are incredibly important to both of those artists. And uh, what Ed has done with those records is just a, a textbook uh, exhibition of how you take a record that has 
to rely on the importance of the vocals and make it all gel and, 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 and match together. Where are you at, Ed? I don't recognize that place. This is, uh, well, this is a, my new room. It's over on uh, Music Square East. And uh, uh, do you see me? I see you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the old Master Phonics complex. Wow, they used to have a um, CalRec there, didn't they? Uh, now, the CalRec, I think, was over at Master Mix. Oh, Master something. This is Ma uh, this was Master Phonics, Glenn Meadows' old complex. Oh, wow. That's and, amazing. Uh, and so now uh, 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 Mike Kerb bought this building, and, uh, um, and mastering is uh, still up front, and, uh, and, and uh, I've got one of the rooms over here now. And uh, so I've been here about three weeks, actually. Wow. Hey, Ed, I, I got this thing. We call them batter's box. Of course, you know you're in it. I want to yeah. fire some questions to you really quickly, and uh, tell me, uh, just tell me the first thing that pops into your brain. I'm going to throw some uh, tracks at you, and tell me what your, what your go-to mic is, what's your compressor, and what's, okay. your, what's your equalizer. I'm going to yeah. try and stump you now. You ready, Ed? Okay, fire okay. away. Lead vocals, male. Uh, lead vocals, male. I, my starting place these days is a, a Neumann U67. Um, now, believe it or not, my go-to compressor is uh, a friend of ours from way back when. I Lacey still Thompson. Like, yeah, Lacey Thompson, the, yeah. L, the uh, LT Sound CLX2. Yeah, well, you and I and have I still, work on that. I still love that. Yeah, and, I, got, uh, I got one. And EQ, I love the GML EQ, the 8200. Hard to beat. Okay, rock guitar. Rock guitar, the mic. My st what I like to do is put up two mics at once. Uh, I like a 57, once again, hard to beat. And I also like something that can take the level, uh, like an 87 with a pad or a Royer, which is uh, a little smoother, but also a slightly different take on it. I like those. Like the, uh, I usually don't compress those going to Oops. tape uh, or to, but I like a, uh, usually a GML EQ again, or uh, sometimes a, an API, but usually a GML uh, accurately portrays what's going on in a real vivid way. Wow. Okay, on, the, on these next ones, just tell me your, your EQ choice, okay? Okay. Acoustic guitar. API 550B. Okay. Uh, acoustic piano. Um, the choice would be an Avalon uh, the Avalon Stereo EQ. 2055? Yeah. Uh, live strings. Live strings. EQ uh, would probably be uh, GML EQ for the transparency and, and bigness. Mm -hmm. Do you make it just, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting off the subject here. What about overheads? Overheads for EQ? Well, normally I use the console and uh, uh, normally track on a, a 9K, SSL 9K. Okay. So I just use a little bit of uh, EQ on the console. Uh, and, and, and what's your favorite room mic and compressor and EQ for rooms? For the room mics, room? Late, lately I've been using uh, Coles mics um, wow. uh, in, a, in a kind of a, a, an XY or a kind of an MS thing and th that, that works pretty well. Uh, the compressor, I like the, uh, for that, I like the console compressor for those. I also like the, uh, the, uh, the Massenberg's... Uh, VCA compressor. I forget the model number, but wow. uh, hey, it, it, it does a good suck and blow thing. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you ain't lost it. I was working with him one time, Herb, and uh, uh, he, he told the he told the artist, uh, "Vamp till you cramp, boogie till you puke," and that meant just keep playing till I stop the tape. I thought we were saying suck and blow. We were talking about Drew's commission. <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was Jason's interview again with the uh, strip club <laughs> thing. Yeah, do you feel comfortable explaining your uh, your MS technique, or is that something you'd rather skip right now? Um, well, it's uh, I, I don't uh, actually. What I do uh, on that in that case is it's a couple of uh, Coles ribbon mics, and you know, as you know, the Coles are they're they're bi-directional. They're hot on both sides, and like a figure so, eight. Yeah, and so what we do is. Uh, 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 and actually, I kind of stole this from the the uh, the fellow that backs me up over there, at, where I usually track. Uh, 
a fellow named Todd Tidwell, and he, he uh, uh, normally I'd been using a space pair, but he said, look, try this. I did, and I liked the way it sounded. And it's really just, it's like what you would consider almost an XY with these figure eights. And uh, it gets a lot of front spank to it, but it also picks up in the back. So it's not truly an MS situation, like an MS box. Uh, okay. I had a C24 one time I used to use a MS box on and it was pretty interesting, but this is not exactly, maybe I overstated as far as M uh, MS, but. Uh, well, it seems like it, MS is gaining a lot of popularity, particularly in the mastering world. A lot of the mastering guys are, uh, are using uh, a little box to kind of help with different mix problems that, uh, that we give them in, in mastering. But, yeah. It seems like that's the hot topic right now. I remember when you first showed me that, we had, we had a 414, we put on a figure eight, we put one side of that out of phase and then mixed a hypercardioid in in front. And I forget what we recorded, but God, that was... A while back, but yeah, back. I had this, uh, an MS box uh, for the C24 and I, it, it's, yeah, that was kind of a, uh, I guess it's that, that trick is so old it's new again. Yeah. Well, I, I think I thought I invented it before I met you, but... <laughs> no, I, I stole it from somebody. And uh, and let's give a shout out to our friend Lacey Thompson at LT Sound. I talked to Lacey about a week ago, the compressor that you said you liked. That, that compressor is very popular in Nashville. I didn't quite make it out here, although I have mine that I use a lot. But the LT Sound, C, what was it? CLX2. CLX2. CL, yeah, CLX2. Uh, is, and, he, uh, is, he, is, he, is he still making those, or is that an no, eBay item? No, he phased those out, and he's been working on a digital compressor that he's real excited about. And uh, uh, but he 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 phased out. I think I don't think he makes those anymore. What's um, your What's your go to uh, reverb in the box? What reverb? Because remember, you and I started out on the EMT two hundred and fifty over there at Web Four. That's right. Uh, that's right. It's um, hard to beat that sound for me. Have you found anything close to that yet? Well, you know, the EMT-250 comes from the dark school as opposed to some of the, like the lexicon was kind of the bright, chippy school sound, you know. And, and what, I, what I do now in the box a whole lot, I, I like uh, about three things. I like the uh, Reverb 1, which is Digit is Avid. I also like a couple of convolution verbs. Um, one is the TL space oh, reverb, yeah. and and also the ultra alti verb, which is yeah. so you can dial up some of those uh, EMT two hundred and fifty uh, sounds, and it's uh, it, it's pretty pretty great what the, how they how they've done that capture the rooms. And, I agree. Yeah. Well, Edward, man, uh, you know, will you come back and hang with us? I want you to do a whole guest segment with me real soon. Now that uh, now that you see that it's it's, uh, it's not as bad as you thought it was going to be. Oh, it's great. I, I, you're my audio brother. I, I, you know. I know. <laughs> well, I, I want everybody to know, when, when I get a phone call from Ed, he is the one that introduced me to a lot of the inexpensive gear that I, I talk about, like the, like the EH-50, the, yeah. the, the little three-band compressor and all that. Ed, let's wrap this up. What you working on now? What you want everybody to know about what you're working on these days? Uh, well, I, I just finished up. A, uh, a couple of projects. One was a Mark Jordan pop project, a uh, fellow out of Canada, guy that wrote uh, Rhythm of My Heart and uh, for, for Rod Stewart. Yeah. Uh, did a great album on him, brand new, uh, recorded. And, and, and then there was this Diane Shure, that, uh, a, a, yes. a blind pianist that's just yeah. great, great singer, great player. Just finished that uh, just a few weeks ago and uh, real excited about that as well. Okay, Ed. Man, listen, thank you so much, and uh, if anybody needs to get in touch with Ed, just, just email us here, and we'll pass on anything you want him to get. Uh, Ed is just humbling. Absolutely. You know, oh, you, 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 you're in the presence of greatness. Yeah. Oh. Man. Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and, and uh, Ed has preserved the concept of Southern humility that I didn't quite bring out here. But, yeah, you, uh, <laughs> you, you lost in L.A. Yeah. Ed's holding the fort. Dave is completely lost. Yeah. Ed, you know I love you. A shout out to everybody that we, you and I know. You know, we, we could go way back. And uh, I'll call you soon, my friend. Please do, and I thank you so much. I enjoyed this. Okay, Ed, Thanks, thank Ed. you. Thanks, Ed. Really appreciate Bye -bye. it. And remember, guys, what you want to do is come uh, get involved with us all the usual places, at Pensado Place by Twitter, email, at thisweekend.com, our Facebook page, our YouTube page. 
So, uh, and obviously, Drew, thank you for Corner Office. And thank you guys for being so active in the Corner Office. We saw a lot of great questions, stuff that we'll get to in the future, some requests for guests. And that's what we want. We want your engagement. We want you involved. So uh, uh, it's been a great week. What do you think, Dave? Man, you know what? This show was for me. I, cool. I, 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 it's, it's great to hear people without accents finally. For a while. Uh, to you. <laughs> to you. <laughs> no. <laughs> to us. Well, we don't accent. have accents. <laughs> right. You guys we have accents. I'm Canadian, so I don't have much yeah. of an accent. You don't have much of anything. Right, exactly. I mean, uh, I started. I started to go, Dave, but you know. That's okay. It's we're, time for We're, you. It's we're time trying to figure out how show. to pay for this fun. <laughs> right, right. But guys, listen. Um, a couple of quick things. The show's going to go uh, to another level real soon. I want you to tell your friends and neighbors about us, you know, and, and uh, I want you to keep... Um, you guys are incredible about constructive criticism and, and ways to make the show better, things you want to see and hear. Uh, even though we might not implement every single, thing, every single thing you ask us to, we, we, we do hear it and we do make an effort and we try to weave it in at some point. Always remember, it's not, a, it's not one show, it's... 50 shows a year, so we, we, we've, got, we, we've got the time to get to everything. And also, uh, remember my friends over at Gear Sluts, Jules, those guys, they, they, they've been in our corner in our camp, and we want to thank them for that. So, adios, my friends, and I will see you, see you next week. We've got some special stuff coming up next week. We're finishing the ITL, and I'm talking to a couple of people I think you're going to find incredibly fascinating next week. Bye.